Live on WFLA Now, with a specialized degree in climate, Chief Meteorologist and Climate Specialist Jeff Berardelli is pioneering the way we look at climate and extreme weather. Welcome to Jeff's Climate Classroom, powered by Armor View Window and Door. All right, uh, welcome everybody. It's been two weeks since Milton and four weeks since Helene. It is hard to believe this area was impacted by two major hurricanes in two weeks' time. I mean, I'm still tired, and I know a lot of us in the Bay Area are. Now, our coast was hit hard. Uh, it's going to take months or even years to fully recover, especially along our coast. Uh, inland flooding was disastrous, and believe it or not, it's still ongoing in some of our communities. And one other thing to add, red tide is uh, widespread in the Gulf right now. So I want to bring up uh, our, our guests during the day today. And, and, and first, uh, we're going to talk about the lessons learned from Milton and Helene and the ongoing effects of it. So my guests today are longtime Tampa Bay resident and oceanographer Ellen Prager. You've seen her on the program before. Hey, Ellen. Hey, how are you doing? Our partner and meteorologist Dave Jones. Hey, Dave. Hi, Jeff. Great to see you. Great to see you, too. And our very own Val Simpson, who helps to make me more palatable, if that's possible. That's right. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited about this episode. I love our guests today. And just a reminder, I do have the buzzer. I don't know. Can you guys hear this? They don't. They might not be able to hear through Zoom. You heard that? Oh, oh, yeah. oh yeah. We can hear that. If but any it- of you start to nerd out. Or like go on a tangent. Actually, I was going to say, it's not for our guests. It's it's for for Jeff. It's It's for for Jeff. Jeff. And guys, I want to remind you, if you're watching us right now, we're live on Facebook. So we will be taking any questions that you might have for Dave or Ellen or even Jeff. And I'll make sure the questions get to them and we'll go through them uh, on our episode today. All right. So why don't we begin uh, with, you know, the fact that, you know, Tampa Bay has really been spared the wrath of hurricanes for a while. Um, These are our biggest impacts in about 100 years, and they came within two weeks' time. It's hard to believe. Helene, 100 miles offshore. In fact, I have Milton. I'm going to pull Milton up for you. But Helene, 100 miles offshore, and it gave us the highest surge we've seen in over 100 years. Then Milton, two weeks later, decides to make a direct hit. Luckily, it weakened tremendously. It was a Cat 5. I think it scared a lot of people, a lot of people in our area thinking that, wow, if it's a 5, I better get out of here, which is good that people left. Turned out that it came on shore as a 3. Uh, but truth be told, it didn't produce anything more than Category 1 force winds in our area. So in some ways, with Milton at least, we dodged a bullet uh, for most of our area. And we're going to talk a little bit about that too, guys, about how if the storm had made a, a di- slightly different track of maybe 25 or 50 miles, it would have been a completely different story in, in places like St. Pete and, and Tampa as well. So, Ellen, you're a longtime resident of the Tampa Bay area. Uh, tell me what was going through your mind as you, we were staring down the barrel of these two major hurricanes. Oh, my gosh. It You know, it's so stressful for people there. I completely felt that. I I know not only from being in Tampa Bay, but I've lived in the Bahamas, I've lived in the Florida Keys, and I've had to deal with this over and over. And so while I'm no longer living in the area, boy, my heart was with all those people thinking about the potential for storm surge and powerful winds. And I will tell you, together, we kept sending updates out and, and really urging people that if the storm surge was predicted to hit their area and they were had been ordered to evacuate, to get out because I think for me at least that's what scared me the most was people not taking the storm surge seriously enough. Yeah. And Dave, you're a longtime meteorologist. Uh, You probably know very well just how vulnerable the Bay Area is. Milton in particular, you know, I'm going to bring up a graphic of Milton right here. These are the uh, SAR synthetic uh, aperture radar winds from space of the storm. And notice where it came on shore right there, Dave, in Sarasota, had it been just 30 or 40 miles north in Pinellas County, uh, what would have been the impact? I mean, the difference is night and day, right? Oh, Jeff, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there have been studies, and uh, one of the worst-case scenarios for the whole United States uh, is a, a Category 3, 4, or 5 hurricane hitting just north of Tampa Bay. Uh, and as everybody knows, winds blow counterclockwise around that low, and they're so intense around the center of the storm. It would have driven so much water into Tampa Bay. It would have had nowhere to go but up and spill right out of Tampa Bay into areas that uh, have never seen storm surge before. So I have a graphic for this. Uh, and what if Milton had moved 30 miles north? So this was the track uh, of Milton. It went right through Sarasota. But 
And you know what I'm going to do? I, that went through. That went by so fast. I want to put a pause in this graphic so everyone can see the difference between you know what what difference 30 miles makes. So just give me a second here to see where I should put this pause, and then we'll play this again. While you're doing that, Jeff, yeah. I do have a question that maybe we yeah. can answer as we're working on this. What do we attribute, or where do we, you know, who do we give thanks to that the fact that it did not hit north of us? I mean, is it true this this uh, Indian burial grounds that we have to? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, we, should, we should introduce your uh, book. So if we're going to do this, we're going to do this. We have to introduce your book. So let's let me, let do, me it. do this. Let me let's bring do your it book because to everybody. We uh, have okay. been so close. Let me bring it up on, on yeah. screen. Uh, and then I'll bring you guys back into the picture. There it is. Now, Wait. this just came out. Was it t today or yesterday? Yesterday. 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 It was Congra the official publication day. Congratulations, guys. So tell me a little about the book and tell me how it deals with, as Val asked, Indian burial grounds. Right. So it's published by Columbia University Press. We've been working on it for several years now. And the, really, the inspiration behind it was to combat misinformation about the ocean and atmosphere and climate change, because there are a lot of there's a lot of things out there that are just not true. And without the right information, people can make really poor choices. And we'll get back to that Indian burial mound issue <laughs> is and I have even had some relatives who say things like, oh, we're not going to worry about the hurricane hitting us because they'll be diverted by the bur Indian burial mounds. <laughs> no. Uh, you know, it just so happens we cover it in the book. Uh, uh, and uh, here's a little a little peek. Yeah. Uh, we went we went back in history, uh, back to um, the 1840s, the 1840s. Okay. And we identified Did you physically four... go back in history or you just mean the research? <laughs> Yeah. Back to the well, we tried to go back in history, but our relatives aren't that old. And we, uh, okay. <laughs> we worked with a, an archaeologist at um, oh, wow. USF yeah. to plot. He he plotted all some like uh, four hundred eighty four yeah. burial mounds, and then what we did is we worked with him to put the tracks of hurricanes back to the eighteen hundreds mm. over those four hundred eighty four burial mounds, and what you see is. Storms don't divert around them. Okay. All, All right. the gotcha. areas have been hit. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, and if you're, you know, last year I did, last summer I did a study with Columbia University and we, we looked at like, we, we simulated millions of hurricanes using uh, climate models. And what we found is that Tampa just simply doesn't get major hurricanes more than about once a century. That is typical because of steering flow. So it's pretty crazy that within two weeks we were, we were hit directly with one major hurricane almost. Uh, and um, and then another one, the impacts were even more major with Helene. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, something else I want to bring up. So I, I want to bring up both of these graphics. So first of all, these were the water levels that we saw. Let me bring it up on, on the screen for everyone to see. These were the water levels we saw. This essentially was the surge that we saw in Tampa Bay, the highest we've seen in over 100 years from a storm that was 100 miles offshore. So I think that is a lesson learned from Hurricane mm -hmm. Helene, which is, and, and this is a lesson learned big time here in the Bay Area because a lot of folks are suffering from this, which is you don't have to be in the core of a hurricane to experience huge impacts. Mm -hmm. right, 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 yeah. Right, and and I think also maybe the fact is we're not dealing with what the steering currents were 100 years ago, mm -hmm. 200 years ago. With right. climate change, the whole environment which controls these hurricanes is changing. And so I think that's another lesson is that we can't necessarily go by go by what happened 100 years ago or 200 years ago. You know, and, and the other thing, too, uh, Jeff and Val, that uh, I have a little beef with, you know, how we identify. Uh, I think the whole meteorological weather enterprise, National Hurricane Center included, how we identify where a hurricane makes landfall. It's always at a single point. Yeah. And uh, yeah. as you know, hurricanes are hundreds of miles wide. Yeah. And the eye wall can be 50 miles wide. It depends on the right. size of the eye. So, you know, when we say it made landfall in Siesta Key, mm -hmm. uh, while that's true for the center of the eye, I think it's also accurate to say that it did hit Tampa. It just sure. didn't hit north right. of Tampa. Yeah, great. Right. Right. That so that was so that was right. So Helene and, and Milton, two different storms. So this is the Milton scenario that I kind of wanted to show everyone because it's very rare that, and let me bring uh, me back, all of us back up on screen, and Val, you remember me saying this. Yeah. It's very rare that I would concentrate on the center of a storm because I understand that the impacts are hundreds of miles away. Mm -hmm. We try to talk about the cone and, and what extends beyond the cone and not the center line. 
But in this particular case, and a very rare instance where I spent a lot of time on TV talking about the center of the storm because it mattered so much. So I just want to show everyone real quick. This was the track of the storm. It moved into Sarasota. Uh, you know, there were some areas that had 10 feet of surge, mainly in southern Sarasota County and south of that, uh, you know, into like Manasota Key. They likely had between 10 and 15 feet of surge. So if this storm had, in fact, gone just, you know, 25, 30, even 50 miles further north, somewhere in that range, that counterclockwise flow would have pushed 10 feet of surge in, but oh it would have been amplified to 15 right. feet of surge because of the contours of the bay and that water being forced in. I don't think people realize, even though the storm was, I mean, it was a Cat 3 when it came on shore, but the winds were really a Cat 1. But even with that said, it brings with it the surge of a Cat 3, Cat 4, right. because it was right. over the Gulf. Yeah. So I don't think people realize how different our life would be today had mm -hmm. this storm hit St. Pete Beach, Madeira Beach, Reddington Beach, Indian Rocks Beach, mm -hmm. and that surge was forced into the bay. Absolutely, yeah, but abs even still, I'm yeah. sorry yeah. to cut you off. I just wanted no, to say no, no. that the precipitation that we saw in the north, the, the over the eye yeah. of the storm, was here. And right. one thing that I learned from this storm storm particularly was you asked me this jeff and you said what do you think creates the most catastrophic storm surge or rainfall totals and i went with storm surge because of what we had seen with lean and you corrected me and you were like no in the recent years that has changed and now it's in fact uh rainfall with these storms so that's something we can talk about guys uh the death uh the deaths over the past 10 years uh 57 percent of them really from 20 2013 to 2022 so i don't have the stats for the last two years but 57 percent was from freshwater flooding we saw that with helene and what happened inland over over the mountains of north carolina yeah yeah whenever you have that kind of uh, rainfall and if you're if that event is preceded by any sort of uh large rainfall event like they had in Asheville, western north carolina you know up to 10 inches of rain the day before um, Helene came up the coast. And then you have that mountainous terrain enhancing the precipitation as it comes in with a hurricane. Oh my gosh, you know, how do you plan for something like that? There's going to be a lot of discussions in the future about how to, yeah. how to warn and how to evacuate mountainous communities. Yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, as you guys have taught me so well, that with a warmer atmosphere, there's more moisture being held and the, the right. rainfall is getting more extreme. And this is happening more often yep. because of climate change. Mm -hmm. So that's also something people really need to understand. And that information yeah. I'm sure is in your book. Uh, so why don't we talk a little bit about that? Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I know that you have information about climate change in here. I know you also have information about disinformation. We had a big problem with disinformation following Helene. A lot of people were saying that we, and you know, I don't know who we are, whether that's the government or meteorologists or who are are kind of conspiring to to make these storms stronger or control these storms. But ironically, there we are as humans to some degree controlling these storms and that we're making them stronger because of a warmer atmosphere and because of climate change. But not intentionally, and certainly we have no control over exactly where storms go and exactly you know, what they produce. So why don't you talk more about how you combat misinformation and disinformation in your book? So again, that was one of the inspirations for us is we just felt like we wanted to get the right information out in an easy to understand way. There's actually a little humor involved um, and, and not scare people, but give them real answers and things like we got, we, we did it by answering frequently asked and kind of zany questions. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions was, you know, what, what questions or um, uh, ideas have been presented to control hurricanes? And so we went to some of the top people at NOAA, the National Weather Service, and we got things like, well, humans are creating hurricanes to hide UFOs. <laughs> no, mm -hmm. no, no. And then how about the other the other one? Well, you know, the other one, Jeff, as you know, and, and Val, you know, we need uh, ocean temperatures of at least 79 degrees uh, mm -hmm. to allow a hurricane to form with that uh, energy in the ocean. Uh, so there are questions uh, that I used to get when I was uh, on the air in Washington, D.C. Um, hey, why don't we just tow an iceberg into the Gulf mm -hmm. of Mexico and cool the Gulf of Mexico so no hurricanes form? Right. Well, <laughs> There's one. I mean, but there uh, are legitimate questions about that and also legitimate questions about dropping nuclear bombs into hurricanes. 
And obviously, yeah, neither creative. of these. I mean, I don't know how you tow an iceberg all the way from the South Pole. It's very different. Okay, you have the it's answers of how book. to do it. Okay, we'll see. That's great. I love it. And Can't it wait like to get my hands fun, on it. Val, doesn't it look like a very fun book? It looks like a fun. Book. It does. I yeah. think Dave and Ellen, they're they they're very fun people, and I think that the book is just as fun as they. You've are. never drank with them. I have. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? All right. Well, um, let's set a date. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, hey, why not right now? Do you have? Oh. <laughs> so I just want to show you guys something. Um, I didn't tell you about this, or maybe you knew about it, but I did another study this summer, and I did it with the Department of Energy. What I did was I localized their study. Your sound. Oh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. All right. We're good. If I was alerting me that that uh, that maybe there was something wrong with my audio, it may have just been my voice. Um, so, um, and this is what I found. So we looked into the later part of the century. We used eight state-of-the-art climate models. We did a bunch of, like, over a million. We simulate, simulated about a, hundred, a million hurricanes. And what we found in the future is that the Tampa Bay area would see about a 250%, 15% increase, or three times the amount of major hurricane strikes. So instead of seeing one every 100 years, we would see one every mortgage cycle, every 30 years or so. Uh, and then look at the bottom there. Max wind speeds would increase by between 15 and 20 percent and max rain rates increasing by around 50 percent which may seem like a lot but you know the study that was done on hurricane helene and its impact on the carolinas one of them found that already uh, in some parts of of that area rainfall rates could have been enhanced by as much as 50 50 percent we're not even at the end of the century no. So I, I don't want to get into the particulars of, of, of what we found in this study other than what I talked about for Tampa. But by the way, it's not just Tampa. It's Miami. It's Fort Myers, especially Florida, and then to a lesser degree, Charleston, but to a large degree, New Orleans and also Houston as well. So, uh, you know, climate change is already having real impacts, right, guys? And and we expect it to continue. Right. And it's not it's not just in hurricanes. I mean, as you know, coral reefs are just feeling the brunt of climate change around the world with, you know, corals live in a certain temperature range. And when you go above that temperature range, either acutely or chronically, you get leaching and mass mortality. And so, yeah, it's climate change is affecting all sorts of things around the world. So you guys talk about um the impacts and Ellen, especially you, let me bring you guys back up. Uh, it, it bring us all back up, uh, especially you, Ellen, because your background is in the ocean. Your background is in oceanography. Um, and also, so I, we talked about this before, but I want to bring up algae. So we have sure. a red tide outbreak that's ongoing. We saw this after Irma. We saw it after Ian. And now after Helene, there's Helene and Milton right there, you can see the progression of that algae outbreak, which seems to be maybe thinning out a little bit here as we head uh, to lately. So there's 1020, and uh, I can push it uh, forward to 1022. So uh, we've had this red tide outbreak that's ongoing across our area. So I think people will be interested in knowing how hurricanes uh, are connected to, to red tide, Ellen. Well, principally, we think what happens is, you know, you have a lot of rainfall and that causes runoff off the land and the rivers to bring a lot of water from the land into the ocean, into the coastal zone. And with that comes excess nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus. It's essentially like dumping a whole bunch of fertilizer in the ocean. And one of the things that research has shown about the red tide organisms is that they can use just about any kind of nutrient to grow and to grow in abundance, essentially. And so if you have a lot of fertilizer going in there, it can either trigger or enhance a bloom of algae or the growth of algae if it's already started or get it started. But most, we think most of what's happening is all of that excess nutrients that been brought from runoff from the rainfall and the surge that went on and then it washed back out up to sea, that is feeding the algae, causing the bloom. Right. And uh, unfortunately, as more people move to Florida, there's more golf courses, courses there's more developments, there's more lawns, right. and there's a lot more of that stuff, sediment flow that's going into the, the Gulf. But I also understand that there's also sediment on the bottom of the Gulf, and that could also be upwelled by hurricanes too, right? So there's some theories, and I'm going to say theories because there's really no real proof of this, mm -hmm. but two things can happen. One, as the waves and surge are coming on shore, you can turn up the sediment. So if there's nutrients in the bottom, in the coastal zone, in the shallow water zone, it can just be churned up. So that's one thing that can happen. There was, uh, there was some work done by, I think, Nick Shea at University of Miami, who showed years ago, and I think it might have been Irma, it spent a long time over the water, in, in the, the deep water in the Gulf of Mexico, and he theorized that 
spending that much time in the open ocean over the Gulf, it could cause upwelling in the open ocean, and then it would drive mm -hmm. some nutrients onshore. But again, that's just a theory. Uh, when you're talking in the coastal zone, in that shallow water, you don't need upwelling. All you need is churning and yeah. runoff to cause right. that excess of nutrients. How about the temperature of the water? Does that play a role? Well, it, it can play a role. There's really one of the really interesting things also, I mean, sadly, about red tide is there's a lot we don't understand. Like, for instance, we don't know what stops a red tide. Why does it stop blooming? We don't know that. Mm -hmm. We do know that fresh water can knock it down because... The, red, the algae don't like low salinities. But temperature, I'm not sure if there's, you know, it has a very exact temperature range. I think it, it may not be so tight that it makes that much difference, but not sure on that one. Well, you know, we we're, we kind of only have a minute or two left. So uh, Val, I want you to ask a last question. And then I want you guys to kind of finish out by telling us a little bit more about the book and how people can get it. Okay, so Val, why don't you... Why don't yeah. you I'm going to pull some questions from our Facebook oh, page okay. from the community. Okay. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah, and so then while you you're doing that, why don't you guys tell us, tell me a little, what's the main, what is, what do you think the main takeaway from your book is? Um, it is ask questions, find credible sources and be curious. You know, that, that is how you discover things. Um, is it like kind of a one oh one? to uh -huh. first and, and i'm interested in the megalodons part of this because yeah. i don't so, so so the megalodons as an oceanographer when i give talks and this, this is true of my colleagues one of the most common questions we get is are there still you know you haven't you haven't explored very much of the deep ocean how do you know megalodons aren't still down there and so we give the explanation as to what's the evidence that they don't exist anymore because they don't right yeah. <laughs> they were they were true very large sharks but they're not there now <laughs> and so where it's not really a 101, it's more like, what's the question you've always wanted to ask about the oceans? Interesting. Or, it, okay. And and they could be frequently asked or it's kind of zany about the ocean or the yeah. atmosphere or climate yeah. change. We collected questions. I think we, we might have gotten some from you. We got some from other colleagues. These are the questions that we all get asked, whether mm -hmm. you're out at a bar or drinking or you're, you know, at a school group. These are things that get. Yeah. And Ellen has, you know, done thousands of presentations. I've done a bunch of presentations and, you know, been on the air. So these are all kind of questions that we've yeah. gotten. We have a whole bunch of them. We couldn't put them all in the book, but uh, they're very common questions that we get asked. Yeah. Sharks, megalodons. Uh, yeah. Sharks, uh, lightning, you know, lightning. Sharks, you know, jellyfish thing, you know. Oh. I love it. I love it. This is really, you know, it's, it's, you, you're really hitting a lot of topics and just a lot of people's curiosity in a fun and interesting and interactive way. Okay, Val, well, I'm going to toss it to you for yes, a question. Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm trying to read some of the comments, and there's not a lot of questions, but people are talking amongst each other, and they are stuck on these Indian burial grounds, oh, I boy, guess. I'm so, not surprised I mean, by that. I am going to invite everybody on Facebook that is making all these comments to read the book. That's mm -hmm. where you're going to get a lot of the answers. But so, some folks are saying uh, that it may have been prayer. It may have been prayer. A lot of people were praying for it not to touch or to make landfall here in the Pinellas County, Hillsborough County area. Um, some others disagree. They say that we still saw a lot of impacts. Did, so maybe yeah. prayer did not help. It, uh, and we're seeing it, it still to today. Our flooded rivers, for instance, is one of the things that we're dealing with still. Everybody, you know what? The internet, everybody has their own opinion about about how, how things shake up. Uh, but one thing is for certain uh, that we, um, you know, got hit really hard, but it could have been worse. Have been worse. And that at some point we will be hit directly by a major hurricane into Pinellas County, in which case that would end up being our worst case scenario. Let's just hope it's no, it's no time soon. Yeah. And, yeah. and Jeff, I would also just add on that, that, you know, if you really think about it with a hurricane, and I saw this as well, when Milton became a category five, uh, then it weakened slightly, then became regained category mm -hmm. five yep. uh, status. A lot of comments I was getting was, oh, my gosh, we've got to get out of here. It's a category five. Mm -hmm. But it was hundreds of miles yep. away. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when you think about the forecast of what it's going to be when it when it actually makes landfall, uh, even if it if it was a five and it goes down to a three mm -hmm. like Katrina, yep. um, mm -hmm. you know, 
it has a big wind field and it's pushing a lot of water yeah, that's, yeah. and you're not going to stop that overnight. That's right. So we were fortunate enough to access some NOAA research buoys that were dropped out of the P3s when they were flying up the coast. They dropped a series of uh, wave drifters and we could see 30 to 40 foot waves mm -hmm. off the coast yep. as Milton was heading towards the beach. Yeah. Bill, the other thing I want to add, because it's something that we talk a lot in the book, is about finding trusted sources. And prayer is fine. But Jeff and Val, I'm glad the community has you. And I hope people recognize that you are a trusted source of information. And so when they're going to make decisions about what to do when a hurricane or some other hazardous threat, that they have you to go to and listen to and trust what you're telling them. And that's the sad part about some of this misinformation, because I think there some people are doubting what mm -hmm. meteorologists are saying. Yeah. And it's so important that everybody yeah. have a trusted source that they can go to to understand what's happening and make good decisions. And, and just like we say with the book, ask questions. Questions yeah. are the lifeblood of learning, mm -hmm. right? And so if you don't ask questions and you just believe what you hear on the internet, you're at a terrible disadvantage when you can yep. turn on Jeff Berardelli <laughs> and watch a scientist I you did know, not pay one, these yeah. guys. I did not pay them. I, I just want to let everybody know. I didn't pay them. They're not buying dinner when we meet up. They're not buying drinks when we meet up next time. Guys, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Ellen Prager, Dave Jones, and Val Simpson. I appreciate uh, the talk. This was really, really interesting. And get that book. I'm going to be getting that book because that's it really does <laughs> yeah, look here. so interesting. Uh, it's a great, it's, it's a great it, you know, way to a, kind of delve into a lot of different topics. Jeff, just one last thing. And Val, it's a great it's a great present for Thanksgiving, you know, when Uncle Joe comes over. Uh oh. And, <laughs> and Uncle Joe, we all know an Uncle Joe. I have an Uncle Joe. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank I want to thank it's you for being, being here. here. And I want to thank, thank everybody you. for watching the Climate Classroom. Again, you can catch us weekly right here, uh, usually on Thursdays, actually. Have a great one, everybody. Watch or listen to Jeff's Climate Classroom, powered by Armor View Window and Door on WFLA social media platforms. And find Jeff's Climate Reports on WFLA.com.